Tonight on Top Gear. It's not really Top Gear, guys. Me and another guy took seven pistols and ran them through the IDPA 5x5 classifier to understand the performance advantage of pistol compensator. Five different competitors shot the P320 AXG Legion in an IDPA match, and I lecture you on what makes a pistol good and why trigger snobbery is dumb. Welcome back to the Humble Marksman channel, the only gun channel here on YouTube, dripping with that BDE, that's right, Big Dad Energy. Got a fantastically bad one for you guys today. What did the apple say to the orange? Nothing. Apples don't talk. That joke got a chuckle from my nine-year-old, just so you know. I'm David, and today we're going to be looking at compensated guns and what tangible benefit do they actually provide in a practical setting. The Instagram set won't let you flex these days without a comp on your gun. And we've already done the whole like measure the muzzle climb thing. It's about a 20 to 30% reduction. But what does that actually mean in a practical setting? I recently reviewed the P320 AXG Legion and almost immediately IDPA changed their rules to allow the use of integrated compensators into the sport. Initially, the ruling was pretty narrow and what they would allow is just ports and comps that were integrated into the gun's design, but they didn't allow thread on comps or pin on comps specifically. They later updated the language to basically as long as it comes from the factory that way it's okay or ports are fine too. The language is a little murky so you might touch base with your area coordinator for an interpretation. And there's a lot of people who know a lot more than me in the comments who tell you that a compensated gun doesn't do anything with a traditional 9mm load. So that's what we're setting out to answer and IDPA is going to be the vehicle for that. And for you guys who are going to insist that I'm going to get kilt in the street for shooting gun competitions. Uh, just some fun facts of things that came from pistol competition. The thumbs forward grip, red dots on pistols, compensators on pistols. And all of that came from competition shooting and it's widely passed around today as the way. This is the way. But that came from competition shooting in the late 80s and early 90s. That's right, it's been around for a while. So we're gonna start with what I think makes a good shooting pistol and then move into the IDPA 5x5 classifier. And then because you guys like to call me a shill or whatever it is, I took the P320 AXG Legion to an IDPA match and let five competitors of varying skill levels shoot it for the match and then recorded their thoughts in their own words. Because they're all shills too, right? And that's how the internet works. I don't care if you call me a shill, guys. It doesn't really phase me, but it's getting kind of cringy at this point how often it's used. So there's a bunch of factors that affect how a gun handles and shoots, and there is a lot, a lot. In fact, I'd say there's more bad intel on the internet than there is good intel, at least in my opinion. I'm in a kind of unique situation to tell you guys this because I've been kind of reviewing a lot of pistols for the past two years and have shot basically all of the hot new guns, specifically the competition-oriented ones. And I am a multi-division master in both USPSA and IDPA. So I'm used to looking at things through a performance mindset and actually measuring things on a timer and being a little bit more scientific with the approach. So I'm gonna rank the characteristics of a pistol from kind of most important to least important. And at any point, if you want to have conversation, throw it out in the comments below. And if you're here, you might as well just throw your favorite emoji in the comments with no comment. And we can try and figure out what that means. So first and foremost, how a grip fits in your hand and the grip geometry, and that's gonna come into play in a couple places here. The profile of the side strap, how the grip tang is contoured and how high up the grip tang goes, how the trigger guard is relieved and how the grip trigger guard is shaped, ultimately all factor in to how you can build a grip on the pistol. You new guys who don't have any training and just kind of getting into pistols, some guns like the Glock have these like thumb rests on the side of thing. This is poor grip geometry because it encourages suboptimal technique, whereas as this gun, the Tanfolio, if you buy into the you should rest your thumb on the safety, it actually encourages good technique. But similarly, the Tanfolio, the CCs, all that kind of stuff, people who are used to shooting striker guns, when they pick up a gun like this, the gun kind of informs how you're supposed to hold it and it locks into your hand and is more stable than a gun that is basically a rounded off two by four that you kind of, it relies on you knowing how to grip pistols correctly and then being able to stabilize it. A gun with good geometry is going to plant the gun in your hand and make it more stable during recoil. It's gonna make it easier to reach the trigger. It's just generally gonna make it a more pleasant gun to shoot. Next up is traction. And traction is really important in about three places on the pistol. There is the grip panels, and that's specifically most important on the side of the gun where your support hand makes contact. The front strap, and that's generally gonna be probably more important even than the 
lower part of the rear strap. Now you can see on this tan folio, the top part of the grip is smooth and that is ideal because it allows you to rotate the gun to get onto the mag release without kind of impeding that progress. The next is balance and I specifically chose the tan folio because this is the best balancing pistol that I currently own and it's because it has a heavy cone barrel style barrel, a bull barrel if you will. And as a result, the balance of the gun is like incredibly neutral. It's slightly forward of the trigger guard, which is actually what you want because when you put a fully loaded magazine into the gun, it balances perfectly. So a gun that is balanced well is going to return to zero well, whereas a gun that is nose heavy is going to want to dip down and recoil when the slide closes more. You can learn how to balance any of these guns with good grip and shoot them well, but it just takes a lot more effort with the nose heavy ones. And I know immediately my CZ bros are like, but my shadow too. The Shadow 2 is a very nose heavy gun that is based off of the old limited gun designs when you're shooting 40 Smith & Wesson on the 2011 platform. And I would say that kind of gun design has kind of progressed a little bit since then and that people tend to favor the more balanced approach to guns. Although lots of dudes shoot CZs really, really well, it's not a knock against them. The next bit is going to be the kind of balance of the spring weights to the ammunition to the slide weight. So there's going to be a sweet spot that is the right amount of weight to strip rounds out of the magazine and put them in the chamber, the right amount of spring weight that is going to allow the slide to go to the rear and come forward without too much muzzle dip upon closing. The ammunition is going to provide the force that you're kind of balancing against that. It's generally a bad idea to to just go and like remove weight from your slide if, unless you're adding a compensator. Compensators change the balance of that equation so you can't just throw a compensator onto a slide and use the same springs and expect to get optimum results. You can get improved results, but generally guns that are coming with the slides balanced to affect the reduction in energy on the slide due to the compensator are gonna be better than ones that aren't. You may notice that everything we've gone through right now so far isn't even talking about the trigger because I fully believe that triggers are less important than a good frame. You can make do with really bad triggers if you have a really good frame. Oh, he's gonna talk about triggers now. No. Still going on weight. Weight is actually something that there is sort of an optimum range for at least a sporting gun and this equation is going to change in the concealed carry world, but just shooting a gun for sport and pleasure, a gun that is nine millimeter, that is about 40 to 45 ounces, people generally are gonna have the best time with. The weight does a couple things. It doesn't dampen recoil necessarily, but what it does do is it allows the gun to settle out from recoil a little bit faster, and, and you're able to hold the gun more steady when you're aiming at a precise shot that you're trying to line up. Now he's gonna talk about trigger. Yes, now I will talk about trigger, but it's not what you think. Next is trigger ergonomics, and that's going to affect the reach of the trigger, the shape of the trigger, and how the shape of the trigger influences your ability to pull the trigger straight to the rear without disturbing the muzzle. There are lots of guns that maybe don't have ideal trigger shapes and maybe don't influence you to pull the trigger straight to the rear. Maybe they influence you pulling the... Well, oh, weird. That influence you pulling shots to the left and the Glock trigger shape out of the box in the factory generally promotes people pushing the muzzle toward their support side. So you kind of have to learn how to do it. The trigger reach on Glocks is a little bit long. So that'd be an example of a from the box, something that isn't as optimum as what some of the other designs are doing these days. The next piece is going to be trigger travel. So a gun that doesn't have a ton of over travel after the striker releases or the hammer falls is going to allow you to shoot a little bit faster and dovetailing into that is going to be trigger reset. A gun that assists you in Throwing your finger forward so you can shoot faster allows you to shoot faster. Guns with weaker resets like the P320, people short stroke those triggers because the trigger throws a little bit long and it doesn't forcefully assist you moving forward. Now Glocks, to their credit, have amazing resets. Like they throw your finger forward. It encourages you to get off the trigger, get back on and be ready to shoot again in a way that the P320 just doesn't. Bore axis. Bore axis is a thing. It can be mitigated with good technique, but the character of a high bore axis gun like most hammer fire guns versus a low bore axis gun like some of the striker guns is that there's less muzzle climb with the lower bore axis gun. It's just physics. On the low bore axis guns, the muzzle doesn't climb as much. More energy is dumped into your arms as a result. So when you shoot a gun like a Glock, it's gonna wear out your forearms in a way that shooting a heavier gun that flips more isn't going to. But that said, it's easier 
easier to stabilize the lower bore axis guns through grip strength because you, you have more advantage in keeping the muzzle down. It's not a huge deal because as long as the gun comes back to zero really well, which the Tanfolio does a fantastic job with, it doesn't matter how much the dot lifts as long as it comes back to the point it lifted from. So that's really it. That's really kind of what matters in a good shooting gun to me. If you've got stuff that you think I left out, now's a great time to throw it out in the comments. Stuff that I don't really think matters and how a gun performs to a point. Basically all guns are coming from the factory with really good triggers. Not great, but good. Good enough anyway, triggers. The pre-travel of a trigger, how much slack there is to remove the slack out of the trigger, like this part doesn't really matter when you're doing performance shooting. The weight and cleanliness of the wall doesn't really matter. You do not notice it when you are shooting for performance. It's not something that even checks in. The people who really care about this usually aren't people who shoot for performance and measure anything it's people who want to brag at the gun store counter or in the safe area if that offends you then i probably am talking about you because it used to be me i spent way too much money on glock trigger kits and all of that silliness and trying to get this set up what generally happens is people progress down the performance shooting path is that they're really involved in setting up triggers and then as they move on and get good, they really don't care. They just want something that's going to be reliable. You can't buy skill through buying trigger kits. I'm sorry. And if you don't believe me, get out your shot timer and get out a B8 target and see if you can take a stock trigger and shoot better groups or for more speed and accuracy versus a modified one. Almost always the answer is going to be no. So where do compensators fit into all of this? All of that is going to be on my standard, you know, non-compensated guns. Compensated pistols like my Bull Armory the ultimate racer. I gotta do it guys, I just love doing that. Compensated guns, you can see that the format of this race gun style pistol has largely changed from what the standard 1911 would be. There is slide lightning cuts on the slide basically everywhere. There is a large aggressive compensator and hey YouTube, this is how they sell the guns. There are no internal modifications to this gun. It's a sporting pistol, it's fine by your stupid rules. Everything about this gun is optimized to account for the fact that there's a gigantic compensator at the front of the gun. You couldn't take an off the shelf like 19. 11 type slide and have it work in the same way as this gun because this gun is built around the compensator. The slide is lightened and that's largely to improve the slide cycling but also to improve how the gun balances because you're introducing a giant counterweight at the front of the gun so you have to take the weight out kind of somewhere in order to promote balance and this gun actually does balance pretty well in hand which is part of the reason I like it because we need to talk about how compensators actually work and this is because the information on the internet is really bad and even some compensator manufacturers are giving out bad information. What makes a compensator actually work is the gas that the cartridge generates when firing. It has nothing to do with pressure and it has less to do with projectile weight. The reason some people recommend projectile weights is because heavier projectile loads generally have more recoil than guns that don't. But that doesn't mean it's working your compensator harder because generally speaking, heavier projectile loads use faster burning powders, which generate less smoke. The lighter for caliber projectiles usually use slower burning powders that require higher charge weights and generate more smoke. And the smoke is what ultimately works the compensator knocks the energy off the slide and provides a counter force to combat muzzle climb. As somebody who shoots open guns in USPSA, I do not care what machinist says otherwise. That is how these guns are designed. That's Nobody is shooting 147 grain projectiles out of their open guns by choice. They're doing it because they can't get access to 124 or 115s. There is a point at which the compensator stops being efficient. So if you take one of these guns and you hold it right next to a target and shoot it at basically point blank range, a compensator and the load is in balance when there's almost no gas exiting the muzzle. And generally speaking, you wanna get kind of as close as you can within reason to what that point is to get maximum effect from the compensator. Once the compensator is overwhelmed and gas starts exiting the muzzle, at that point, all you're doing is increasing recoil. So that's a brief history on how compensators work. And immediately the question's gonna be, well, what do I do for my nine millimeter minor gun? Well, you want, generally speaking, a hotter 115 grain load, higher velocity, like a NATO style load, like S&B is 
is pretty good for this stuff. That style of loading is gonna work a compensator on a gun a little bit harder. And to that point, the Shadow Systems DR920P that is featured in the video has a much larger port at the front of the compensator than the Spectre Comp from the P320, which has a very small port up front. So loads that are going to overwhelm the comp on the SIG are not going to work the comp on the DR920P. And that's why you kind of have to experiment if you've got a compensated pistol as to what is going to work. And so now that that fire is lit, let's meet all the guns in the video. And YouTube, none of these guns have been modified from their original condition inside the gun. They have optical sights and they may have grips on them, but that's it. All external non-performance enhancing mods. A lot of time went into this video, guys. So if you could hit the subscribe button, I appreciate it. First is the Masterpiece Arms DS9 Hybrid IDPA model. It's a 43-ish ounce, five inch 2011 style pistol with a single action only trigger, good grip, two pound trigger that's super precise. Four axis is high, balance is good, slightly muzzle heavy, and there is no compensator or porting on it. Next is the Shadow Systems DR920L. The weight is very light at just 22 and a half ounces, and it is a safe action trigger pulling about five and a half pounds. The grip geometry is great, grip traction is great, bore axis is low, and there are no compensators or ports. Same profile as the 920L is the DR920P from Shadow Systems. The weight's even lighter at just under 22 ounces. There is less steel and barrel at the front of the gun for the aluminum comp. The trigger is a safe action trigger at about five and a half pounds. Grip geometry similarly great, and grip traction great. Bore axis is low, but this one is compensated. Onto the SIG lineup. The first is the SIG Sauer P320 AXG Pro which is the gun I actually chose to shoot the only IDPA major match I shot last year because the grip is awesome. The gun weighs just over 31 ounces. The grip geometry is superior. The traction with these lock aluminum grips is superior. The trigger is kind of meh and just over four pounds. It has a long stroke and a long reset. The bore axis is pretty high and it is non-compensated. The compensated version of the AXG Pro is the new P320 AXG Legion. Same stats as all the other gun. It's a little bit lighter than the AXG Pro, but it's got the slide integrated expansion chamber or slide comp as the rest of the world calls it on the front of the gun. Then we're getting on to the P320 Max. The P320 Max is the P320 Legion that is cut for the Romeo 3 Max optic with a different slide profile. The weight is just over 40 ounces. The Geometry of the grip is not as good as the aluminum framed version of the guns. The traction is actually, I would say, mediocre. The trigger is the same as the other models. And just a fun fact, Max Michelle actually modifies his grip modules on his gun to remove kind of the hump on the outside of the grip tank, which makes it feel more like the AXG profile. So fun fact there. If I were competing with this style gun, I would look really hard at figuring out a way to get better traction onto the pistol. Next is the P320 Spectre Comp, which is the same profile as the Max. It basically is the same as the Max, but it has a sight block compensator at the front of the gun. The springing is different, the weighting of the slides a little bit different, and the traction on the grip is actually improved a decent amount, so it sits, you know, stays put in your hand a little bit better. And yes, at the end of the video, I will give you my list on how I ranked the guns. So the IDPA 5x5 classifier, for those of you who are not familiar, it is a four string course of fire that requires 25 rounds and one IDPA target at 10 yards. The four strings are shot in sequence and then each point out of the zero zone on the target adds one second to your time, unless it's on the edge, which adds three seconds and a miss on target is five seconds. It's a good benchmark kind of training drill to see sort of where you're at and it's great to do cold since the round count isn't that high as far as these kinds of tests are concerned. Admittedly, the IDPA classifier only is concerned with your recoil management, your draw, your reload, and your strong hand shooting. That's really all that it tests, but that's what a compensator improves so it seemed appropriate to look at. As far as the gear, we used IDPA compliant belt gear, uh, just whatever holsters we happen to have that fit the guns that we were shooting, but I used the Ghost 360 mag pouches that I put electrical tape on to make IDPA legal. Nice thing about the Ghost pouches is that they accept any magazine from a CZ style mag up to a 2011 style mag. It's nice not to have to take the mags off your belt if you're somebody who you know brings a bunch of different guns to the range. If you wanna save money on the Ghost gear, then you can use the code GEARUP10 at Ghost Holster 
MrDirect.com. So let's start with what I thought was gonna happen. I expected to be shaving about a second and maintaining the same points using the compensated version of each gun versus the non-compensated versions of each gun. That wasn't exactly what happened for me, but I also shot it with my buddy Daniel, who is a middling expert who has moments of brilliance in the match, but his fundamentals aren't quite as strong. He actually did see that second and a half or so improvement using the compensated models versus the non-compensated models. His competition gun is the P320 Legion, so when he got onto the SIG guns, he shot great. The other guns were a bit of a learning curve. We shot the guns in the order that we just went through in the introduction of the guns, so we shot the 2011 style gun first and then worked our way down to the SIGs with the SIG Spectre Comp being last. A flaw of this style of testing is the guns that we shot first are gonna have higher scores than the guns we shot later on just based on the fact that you get warmed up and get locked in on the pistols. Ultimately, what ended up happening, at least with my times, was I was about eight tenths of a second faster with the compensated guns. And guys, I'm not fluent on any of these guns. I compete with the open gun you just saw. So I'm not locked in with any of these guns on technique. I think with training, I probably could separate that value on the different guns more, but I was only about eight tenths faster. For you guys who are prized on sort of the speed side of the house and good enough accuracy, you're probably going to fixate on the fact that it was eight tenths of a second faster, but the hits were nearly as good, which is really close to the zero mark. That said, the compensated guns promoted me not gripping the gun as hard as I should have, and as a result, my groups opened up a bit and I dropped some points. So I averaged one point down with the non-comp guns up to two points down with the compensated guns. So in IDPA scoring, I was actually a little bit slower with the comped guns, but they they were much, much easier to shoot. Conversely, Daniel, when he shot the guns, was about two and a half seconds faster. He similarly dropped about a second and a quarter more points on average. So both his times were actually about a second and a quarter faster with the compensated models of the guns versus the non-compensated models of the guns. We both agreed that there were advantage. And in the world of IDPA where ESP carry optics and CCP now allow for the use of compensated guns, both of us agreed we probably would use them. Underscoring that point, Daniel with the Spectre comp after the reload string of fire ended up having a bad index and sending four shots into the one zone clustered together, you know, very tightly that jacked his score up on the compensated models. The distance, if he were able to index on the center of the target, the ground between the comp and non-comp models would grow even more to just over two seconds. So as an expert, he would be shooting about two seconds faster on the classifier. For a long time in IDPA, there were no comps available. So just having a heavy gun, the effect is somewhat similar using a heavier gun, but having a heavy gun with a comp compensator probably makes it a little bit nicer. So next we took the P320 AXG Legion to an IDPA match where I specifically chose about five people to use the gun of all different skill levels up and down the spectrum just to see what the effect of a compensated gun was. Everybody who participated in the test were people who already shot p320 so there was no like learning curve of coming up to speed on that the p320 is really popular in idpa and so this is what they kind of had to say about it nathan idpa master i shoot a sig 320 max uh this gun shoots really flat i like the trigger and the grip is amazing i'm sherry and i'm at uh, the frisco idpa i usually shoot the sig x5 i have a million sigs but this one tonight may be my favorite. We may have to retire the X5. It was awesome. I didn't feel any recoil. So for a little girl like me, you know, I really noticed those things. I really liked it. It was very smooth. I loved the trigger. I didn't have any complaints. I shot uh, Federal 124s through it. Didn't have any problems. So I'm sold. And do you feel like the dot recovered faster than what you normally have? You know, I think it did because I Usually when I shoot a new gun, I'm just like all thumbs, but tonight I kind of pull, you know, pull through. Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin. I shoot IDPA. I am a sharpshooter in carry optics. I've been shooting a Canic uh, polymer rifle for about six months now. Today is the first time I hold this gun and I shot the whole match with it. Uh, I think it actually saved about two seconds per stage for me. I usually cannot break the 20 seconds per stage. But today I have quite a few that are 18 raw. Um, 
I just had to get used to it. I think uh, uh, the group is great. Uh, I can see the dot most of the time. Uh, if I cannot, it's a shooter's problem. It works fine with my 147 subsonic ammo. I have zero issue with my ammo. I really enjoy shooting it. Do you feel like the compensated gun provides a significant advantage over a non-compensated gun? Oh yes, it does. I think um, the shot to shot is faster because I can see the second shot faster. Uh, it definitely is a lot flatter than my other guns. I am Danny. I am an expert in IDPA. I shoot carry optics X5 Legion. Uh, just shot the AXG Legion comp. Excellent gun. Uh, I think it was uh, easy to handle, super light, uh, pushed different rounds through it, and it's just, it snaps back really fast. Really love it. Can't wait to try it out with different grip modules. Do you think it provides a significant advantage in the context of a major outdoor match? Absolutely. I think uh, what I did notice that it was just easy to get back on target. It was just the transitions. I mean, I was a lot quicker than my X5. It's just brilliant. So the dot recovery was better than yeah. a non-compensated gun? Absolutely. Hands down. Right on. Thank you. Generally speaking, the result was that everybody liked the compensated guns and would probably look at using a compensated gun in the pistol competition now that they are legal. So that was interesting because the number one gun for Daniel was the Shadow Systems DR920P. Now it's worth noting right now that the type of shooting that IDPA promotes generally doesn't favor the big heavy guns quite like the USPSA side does now that the compensators are legal. What happens is the compensated guns shoot like heavier weight guns. They're kind of a force equalizer. But similarly, having really good traction and good grip ergonomics also promotes stability in how the guns shoot. The Shadow Systems is very squared away in that regard. It has a very well sculpted grip tang, has excellent access under there and great traction on the side of the gun. You're able to really lock in on the pistol. Since it has the most aggressive compensator in the mix, it makes the gun shoot like a much larger, heavier gun, but it still retains the benefit of being a lightweight gun. It comes out of the holster a little bit faster since it's only 21 ounces, and similarly reloading it because it comes with a magwell on there, the plastic Glock style magazines slip into the grip in a way that doesn't bind in the way that the aluminum and steel frame guns do. The compensated lightweight guns seem to handle a little bit better than the heavier weight guns, but even in the non-compensated models, he tended to prefer the lighter weight guns with better grips to the heavier guns with less aggressive grips. What's interesting is that Daniel competes with a TXG grip module on a standard Legion and he chose the Max last. That was surprising because that gun is most like the gun that he normally competes with. Another thing worth noting with Daniel is he had no real practical experience with single action only style guns in competition. So it took a lot of effort for him to manage the manual safety process. And as a result, he didn't enjoy that as much. So now we're getting into my list. Now, as I mentioned, the average engagement in IDPA is generally between eight and 12 yards there can be shots that are much further but the targets are kind of big you're not shooting it like a quarter size target you're shooting in a zero zone which is like a eight inch diameter circle or something like that even when it's partially obscured with like a no shoot or hard cover there is still usually plenty to aim at the head boxes aren't that small either so the benefits of a big fat heavy gun are not as applicable in IDPA if you were to have this same list in USPSA the list would be totally different because that has a higher level of shooting. Generally, there is going to be small steel targets at distance in most matches. The heavyweight guns in USPSA tend to get more benefit than the lighter weight ones. But in IDPA, the benefit from the heavier weight guns and the precise triggers isn't exploited as much. Now I'm about to show you the list, but just know that there is a lot of room for personal preference in this. If you look at what my times were, there isn't a tr huge amount of variance between the guns. At my skill level, I'm able to get largely the same performance out of all of the guns. I prefer a 2011 style gun. I like the way the grip sits. I like the grip tang. I like how it locks in. I like the huge magwell. There's a lot of things that it has going. It's just in the IDPA game, like the, the slide release, being able to work the slide release with your thumb on the the reload is worth you know two tenths of a second probably versus the dropping with your support hand and rebuilding the grip so in idpa specifically 
guns that have the slide stop, you know, drop with support hand load are gonna be a little bit slower because that's a huge part of the game mechanic. But that said, yeah, I chose the Shadow Systems too. The Shadow Systems gun with the compensator, it just felt the most dialed in. If you look at the brass ejecting from the gun, it is very well balanced to where it's probably a little bit too close to the line as the recoil spring breaks in further. This only has probably just over a thousand rounds on it at this point. As the recoil spring continues to break in on this gun, the brass ejection will get more positive, but it has the largest compensator. It is the lightest weight. The handling is superior and for all the other reasons I just mentioned. It just seemed like I could get the most out of this pistol. Moving on, I preferred the lighter weight guns. The SIG P320 AXG Legion is honestly not far away from this. Uh, the trigger reset, I had trigger freeze on the Legion and the Glock style trigger on the Shadow Systems guns assists in reset. So for going fast on the same target, this just felt a little bit nicer and it doesn't flip as much due to the lower bore axis, but the grips are superior. I could probably use either one of those guns interchangeably with this one. The grip and the traction on the AXG Legion are actually superior to the Shadow Gun. So I, I mean, they're very, very close in my mind. But another thing that the Shadow System has going for it is this takes Glock mags. P320 mags cost 40 to 50 bucks, depending on which one you try and buy, versus if you buy Glock mags, you're spending closer to 30, or if you buy the mag pull versions of the magazines, it's even less than that. So that is kind of nice. P320s are fun guns. I like P320s, I shoot P320s well, but I hate buying P320 mags because the magazine are so expensive. The 2011 style gun is an enthusiast gun and it would be the gun that I probably would pick. If I was serious about competing, I would wanna figure out a way to get the barrel ported or something like that for the benefit that that provides. But like I mentioned, I like the 2011 style guns. They're just a little bit nicer for me. So even despite my classifier performance not being as good with the gun, I still probably would pick the masterpiece gun over most of the other gun. Since I shot the gun first, the masterpiece gun doesn't have my best effort but I would still probably pick it before all the other ones despite the shortcomings of the support hand dropping the slide on the reload. And guys, I know that single action only guns are kind of popular right now, but you have to learn how to put safeties on in order to get your gun handling safe to where you could actually compete with them. It's not just a get a 2011 and from the box, you're gonna be a better shooter. That's not how it works at all. You gotta learn how to do this when the sights aren't on target, especially as you're going to holsters. I've got another video as to why that would be. I generally wouldn't recommend a single action only gun to most shooters until they have come up the learning curve and have gun handling on a subconscious level. So there is a very, very wide margin for preference. Don't look at that list and be like, well, that's it. That's the meta for IDPA. Maybe, but you know, shoot what you want to guys. This is ultimately a sport that we do for fun. And if you don't like, shadow system style guns, then shoot the kind of gun that you do like. It doesn't really matter that much because largely it is a shooter issue at the end of the day. The compensators absolutely do provide an advantage. It's pretty much undeniable to me at this point. It just kind of depends on you and if you're able to get at that advantage and exploit it. So if you made it this far, guys, please hit the like button and subscribe. I appreciate you guys and I'll catch you on the next one.